welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm the author of the Young Adult Fantasy Fury and Rising and the sequel Into the Unreal. And this is English Nerd. So in today's edition of All About a Tale of Two Cities, I wanted to talk about not one, not two, but four different chapters. Now what I've generally been doing in the past is talk about just the sections that Dickens himself released in all the year round that journal but I just felt like all these chapters were so closely related that instead of making two videos about these chapters it would make more sense to do just one. So um, chapter 17 through 20 is what I'll be looking at and if you're wondering why I'm so dressed up these are the Lucy and Darnay wedding chapters and since they really have zero friends apparently who go to their wedding figured I would look nice uh, for the occasion. So chapter 17, one night, is just the night before the wedding which um, John Barsad told the Defarges about in the previous chapter. If you haven't gone back and, and checked that out, totally should. Um, but anyway, it's the night before the wedding. It's just Lucy and her father. They're spending some time together under the plane tree. Up to this point, Lucy has been Dr. Manette's rock and continues to be, but they're reminiscing about their life together and how things might change. And it's the first time that Dr. Manette really opens up about his prison experience with Lucy. Um, he does not like to talk about it because he's afraid he might relapse. But it's interesting getting a little bit of a glimpse into his thought process when he was in prison how he speculated about the his unborn child while he was there and thought, well, maybe it'll be a boy and he'll avenge me. Maybe it'll be a woman who just thinks that I've died and, and remembers me in different ways. And Lucy, of course, is, is just very sweet and says that she hopes nothing will, nothing will change between them even though she's getting married. Darnay and she will um, be right there with Dr. Manette, so he doesn't seem worried at all. Um, this chapter is one of those chapters that supports my idea that Lucy Manette, although she moves the plot, she is the golden thread that ties everyone and everything together. Um, she's kind of a, a bit of a stick figure herself, and again, Dickens is known for his characters. He has excellent characters. I love Laurie, I love Pross, I like Dr. Manette, I like Carton, I like all these different characters, but Lucy is just hard to hard to really get that attached to and the reason is that she has no flaws. None at all. She's just perfect and perfectly sweet and if she had some kind of flaw I feel like I would relate to her more and be able to cheer on her successes more but it could just be my own my own problem. I think Dickens was kind of idolizing his um, crush affair at the time, Ellen Turnin, uh, who he based Lucy on. So that's all that one day is about. It's it's a short chapter. It has not a ton of substance. It's more of a character moment and um, and that's all. Chapter 18 is where we get the actual wedding. So congratulations Darnay and Lucy. Darnay really didn't have much competition in that bachelorette contest if you even want to call it that. I mean Striver, please. Carton, not so much. So Darnay it was. In the chapter nine days, it starts off uh, with a kind of ominous first sentence. I guess not ominous. We don't know that it's ominous quite yet, but the marriage day was shining brightly and they were ready outside the closed door of the doctor's room where he was speaking with Charles Darnay. So you guys know because you read the Two Promises chapter that Darnay promised that he would tell Dr. Manette his true name on the morning of the wedding, but not before, at the doctor's insistence. And so we know that he's actually the Marquis St. Evermont. That's his, his real name is Charles St. Evermont. And Darnay is like a version of his mother's maiden name. So he's, this, this is bound not to go well. Dr. Manette has a lot of baggage with the French aristocracy and now for Darnay to come out and say that he's a French aristocrat is uh, probably not gonna be the greatest, but while they're talking um, it, privately behind closed doors, we also have a conversation between Laurie and Pross, who are like the only people who attend this wedding. I don't know why. 
I'll leave that there. But uh, Lori and Pross, it's worth looking at their their conversation because it shows how much Lori has changed or maybe just reveals who Lori really was from our first impression of him at the beginning. So <laughs> it says about page into the chapter or so, Lori turns to Miss Pross and says, well, but don't cry, said the gentle Mr. Lorry. I am not crying, said Miss Pross. You are. I, my Pross. By this time, Mr. Lorry dared to be pleasant with her on occasion. You were, just now. I saw you do it, and I don't wonder at it. Such a present of plate as you have made him is enough to bring tears into anybody's eyes. The plate is uh, silver, so Lorry gave um, Lu uh, Lucy and Darnay silver as their wedding gift. I, I like this because it's that projecting thing, you know, when you're feeling a certain way and you just project those emotions onto other people. Lori totally is doing that here. He's like, oh, no, don't don't cry, Pross. And she's not crying. She's perfectly fine. But he's totally crying and just projecting onto her uh, these, these emotions as well. But it's good to see him loosen up a little bit. You know, Mr. Laurie was so uptight at the beginning, like, ah, oh, time to do some math instead of feeling the feels. But now he cares enough about the Manettes and Miss Pross as well that he is willing to not only have emotions, but even to show them, which is uh, very different for our enlightenment figure. So he's not this strict enlightenment figure that has no bend or change the entire time because that theme that people are mysteries. People are mysteries. They're not just one dimensional unless they're Lucy. Um, they're, they have multiple dimensions and so Lori is mostly an enlightenment figure but he has this softer side as well which is sweet. Um, <laughs> he even says this is an occasion, this wedding is an occasion that makes a man speculate on all he has lost, dear, 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 to think that there might have been a Mrs. Lorry any time these 50 years almost. Not at all, from Miss Pross. You think there never might have been a Mrs. Lorry? asked the gentleman of that name. Pooh, rejoined Miss Pross, you are a bachelor in your cradle. And he goes, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> I, I just think it's cute. Like now he actually has friendships and he's not afraid to open up a little bit. And he thinks, you know, I could have had some, some love, you know, in the past. So anyway, just wanted to take a look at, at those two characters, but Laurie in particular. After this, it says the door of the doctor's room opened and he came out with Charles Darnay, but he was so deadly pale, which had not been the case when they went in together, that no vestige of color was to be seen on his face. So yeah, the doctor heard the news that Darnay's name is not Darnay, and he is freaking out. Uh, note, by the way, that Darnay has not even told Lucy his real name. He's only told Dr. Manette, and that is not going over well. So the wedding comes and goes in a flash, and off the newlyweds go on their honeymoon and as soon as they leave Dr. Manette relapses into making shoes his old habit of uh, that comforted him when he was in such mental distress so as soon as Lori and Miss Pross hear that knocking of of the shoemaking they know what's happened and they're just utterly devastated they're horrified and they agree that they have to keep an eye on Dr. Manette, get him out of this if they can, and not tell Lucy a thing. Because she would feel responsible, right? She, she would want to, like, break it off with Darnay or something and go back to only attending to her father. It would just not, not be good. And so they, they do their best, the two of them, Miss Pross and Mr. Lorry, the kind of unlikely duo, to watch over Dr. Manette, try to kind of snap him out of it. Like, Mr. Lorry will come over and invite Dr. Manette for walks. Like, look, we can go outside this room, this unlocked room, and walk around freely and, and nine days, hence the title of the chapter, of course. Nine days pass before Dr. Manette kind of comes to himself and realizes where he is. He thinks the wedding was the day before, like, he, he was... He was not, not with us at all. 
Which brings us to chapter 19, an opinion. You can see these chapters are pretty, pretty simple, so might as well just cruise right along. So chapter 19, an opinion, is when you finally have Dr. Manette coming back to himself. And Mr. Laurie does that Laurie-like thing. If you remember in the preparation uh, in book one, when Mr. Laurie was trying to break the news to Lucy that her father was actually alive, even though he'd been thought dead all these years. Uh, here here he does the same thing where he says oh um i have a friend a friend with a problem that's for sure and dr manette realizes that laurie's talking about him very quickly but that actually facilitates the conversation they're able to talk pretty freely about this hypothetical situation of you know a friend in distress without dr manette seizing up because he's using first person pronouns and and uh, he feels a little bit more protected when he's talking about this friend instead of about himself, even though they're not, he, everybody knows what's going on in the conversation. It's an, it's a, it's an interesting look into Dr. Manette's character, because this is where he really admits that the, that the shoemaking was such a relief to his mind when he was in prison that he just can't, he can't bear the idea of being without it if he were ever to find himself in that situation again but after being really nervous about it and just incredibly uncomfortable um, Dr. Manette does finally agree to let Mr. Lorry dispose of the shoemaking bench as long as he's not around he'll probably just fight it if he's not around you know you have to respect Mr. Uh, Dr. Manette for knowing himself well like when he told Darnay not to tell him his true name until the morning of the wedding because he didn't want to react badly and, and ruin Lucy's happiness. Here he knows that he's not going to take to the disappearance of the bench very well, and yet he knows that it's probably good overall. And so he he says, yes, you can, you know, you could get rid of your friend's forge. He'll probably get over it. No, all this code is quite clear. The... There, there are a few interesting moments here, but I want to focus on the end of the chapter. End of the chapter is when Laurie and Pross get rid of the shoemaking bench. They want to prevent Dr. Manette from having these relapses, and they're hoping that this is, will be a method to do it. So look at the, look at the language used here. It's, it's really pretty cool. So uh, there's also a, a picture, so I'll, I'll show you a Fizz picture while I read. On the night of the day on which he left the house, Mr. Lorry went into his room with a chopper, saw, chisel, and hammer, attended by Miss Pross carrying a light. There, with closed doors, and in a mysterious and guilty manner, Mr. Lorry hacked the shoemaker's bench to pieces, while Miss Pross held the candle as if she were assisting at a murder, which, for which, indeed, in her grimness, she was no unsuitable figure. The burning of the body, previously reduced to pieces convenient for the purpose, was commenced without delay in the kitchen fire, and the tools shoes and leather were buried in the garden. So wicked do destruction and secrecy appear to honest minds that Mr. Lorry and Miss Pross, while engaged in the commission of their deed and in the removal of its traces, almost felt and almost looked like accomplices in a horrible crime. I like this because we have the honest Mr. Lorry, the honest Miss Pross, and all they're doing is destroying this shoemaker's bench, but the language here is as though they're committing murder. They're, they're chopping, they're hacking the body to pieces and burning it in the kitchen fire. They're acting like accomplices in this terrible crime, and yet they're doing nothing wrong. The contrast between these people and what we've seen brewing with the revolutionaries and what we will see in the future is striking. There is no violence here, and yet they're still feeling this, this guilt as though they're, they're doing something wrong. And then finally, chapter 20 wraps up this group of chapters, the wedding chapters, I like to think, and it's a, a plea. So the plea comes from Sidney Carton. Sidney Carton is the first one to welcome the pair home. <laughs> I feel like that would be super awkward for both of them. From Lucy's perspective, it's like, this guy confessed that he loved me, but also doesn't want to be with me. And he looks like my husband, but worse. And then from Darnay's perspective, it's like, um it's over go home you have no more shot with my wife also we're not friends remember that dinner that we had a while ago you know where you were t 
totally weird with me. So it's it's kind of funny to me that it's Carton who welcomes the pair of them home and he just has a, a request of, of Darnay and that's all. And it's kind of an, it's an awkward request too. Basically anything he does is just awkward. So he says, if you could endure to have such a worthless fellow and a fellow of such indifferent reputation coming and going at odd times, I should ask that I might be permitted to come and go as a privileged person here, that I might be regarded as a useless, and I would add, if not for the resemblance I detected between you and me, an unornamental piece of furniture, tolerated for its old service and taken no notice of. I doubt if I should abuse the permission. It's a hundred to one I should avail myself of it four times a year. It would satisfy me, I dare say, to know that I had it. So could I, could I come and go whenever I want in this house? <laughs> Like a piece of furniture. It's interesting that the last chapter was like all about a piece of furniture and now he's comparing himself to this piece of furniture that's just tolerated for its old service. Because that's kind of what like the shoemaker's bench was. It was really important to Dr. Manette, but ultimately sort of useless. So anyway, like what would you say? What would you say? Can I just stop in anytime? Darnay wants to say no. But he remembers how Carton saved his life when they first met, and he feels like he doesn't have a good enough excuse to say no, so he's kind of stuck saying yes. When he tells Lucy about it later that night, sorry about the car noise, by the way, suddenly it got all loud. But when he tells Lucy about it later that night, Lucy does say, you really have to be kind to Mr. Carton because he might be a terrible person in a lot of ways, but he has the, he has these wounds that he doesn't let people see very often. And Lucy's really the only one who knows that because in The Fellow of No Delicacy, she got a glimpse into like the pain um, in his heart that even Striver and some people who are more often close to him don't get to see. So Darnay, of course, is like, oh... Lucy, my love, you are so compassionate and sweet, and and uh, Carton is of that of that same opinion. He's grateful that that she thinks of him at all, really. So those are those are the chapters. Chapter twenty one. The next one is a doozy, so that's probably just going to stand all on its own. If you have any questions about these chapters, put them down below. I'd love to have a bit of a discussion with you guys. Like this video if you like it, and don't forget to subscribe for more English nerdy goodness. Alright, 